Okay. Glad you guys in here because I do want to definitely get out of 250 before the seniors take those snapshots of them and everything. Uh, you know, senior porch, you know. I don't think they can do that. Right? I don't think they can, you know, do too much of their time or something. But I'm sure it's going to look good. Our fly seniors and everything starting around three. But anyway, tomorrow's quiz to get back into it. Thank you guys. He, he's, listen, everybody can't be all like, hey, Trinity. He's just not that type of guy. Look, by the very default that you're a teacher, unless you're like Hannibal Lecter or something like that, you're going to really like black kids in a way, in a general way. It just they can't react to different kids. Just don't take it personal like that. You know, now, again, that's just what happens. What's so great, he's young, he probably can relate, but he has a different demeanor. That's all that is. No, he, he's not. He doesn't know you. I'm telling you, by the end of, like, you know, him staying here alone, he will be breakdancing and stuff like that. Like, oh, like, again, I... I still don't like him in the show, so... All right, so... I hate him. Just speaking to the microphone here. <laughs> like that, you know. <laughs> uh, um, tomorrow, the quiz is on the progressive movement. What you might want to do to dig out the archives, and they have time to put on the Moodle, maybe I'll put a blank one, is your old quiz number 12 that, like, you know, that you got 110 on. There will be a few questions from here. No, I'm not cutting and pasting the questions from here to put on to quiz number one for tomorrow, but the content. And that's why I want to start today. The first question on tomorrow's quiz is this. The first question is, and you're going to answer this, what is the historical context of the progressive era? And you should be able to do that in a couple of sentences. And it's, you're going to get sickened by historical context, historical context. So you, that should always be in your introductory paragraph when you're writing essays. So. Take about 30 seconds here, and maybe somebody's going to start us, like maybe with the time period, maybe give us some background here. What is the historical context of the progressive era? And thank you guys for, you know, this week trying to get out of first gear back into second, you know, and back to third, like second, and back to overtime. Great, Trinity. U.S. imperialism at this time, all right? Yes. You do have this in the late 19th century. Can you relate it to the progressive era? I think uh, most people in here are going to be a little bit confused about that. Yes. Imperialism. You might want to tell them. Are we? Yeah, taking over a country or territory. But can anybody relate? How can that relate to the progressive era? Trinity, did you have any mind? I think you're kind of thinking about the time period of progressive era and it's involved during, during the progressive era. But how can you kind of connect that? Go ahead. There you go. You hit the nail on the head. During that debate of like the anti-imperialist, anti-imperialist league versus the, you know, going ahead and like versus McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt and all those guys taking over territories, people started to say, hey, what about lynchings here? What about the, you know, plight of the working conditions here at home? So that can see that that's some background. Anything else here that can just be part of it? What is the historical context? You may think about the same script that we had yesterday, like Mr. Price, I don't even remember five minutes ago, like that. So can you kind of like sum up here in a way? And this is the first question on your quiz tomorrow. Probably the most important question. Go ahead. How would it relate to ushering in the progressive era? You got to give linkage. You can't just kind of like what I was just trying to, you know, uh, call Trinity on. How can we link the Gilded Age to the Progressive Era? Somebody else will go ahead, sir. So the Progressive Era was probably the Gilded Age, which was also the Progressive Era. Yes. 
that's actually perfect. You know, the progressive era is coming out of the problems of the Gilded Age. And we know the Gilded Age really makes modern America, but there are problems. I don't want you to think that like it's wholesale, like, you know, trouble in the Gilded Age. But people are finally going to decide, how could we, as a nation, with the mentality of government is too powerful, too big, like that, you know, how can we limit it? states' rights, like that, to a point where we're going to get almost a consensus, for the most part, of people in the progressive era says government needs to step in, all right? Now, again, another one of those things that we need to know about progressive era, radical change or some kind of moderate change in reform? Moderate change in reform, all right? You have to have moderate change in reform. This is not some kind of, like, you know, radical thing. Matter of fact, you know, really the two reasons, all right, for progressivism, one of them is, is that to prevent the kind of anarchy, social unrest that they may see abroad or they see stirring up and everything, that we need to fix some social inequality. We need to do some things into the city. That's one of the reasons for progressivism, all right? So, and the other one is for to make sure is this, like, it's great that we have, you know, uh, Standard Oil and eventually, like, you know, U.S. Steel, but now we need some types of, you know, regulations, some kind of restraint in businesses. So those are really the two motivations coming out of, like, you know, again, the progressive era. Anything else to give it a little bit more context? Anybody want to give us a kind of time period, which you guys seem to have kind of shied away from? And again, you know this can be debated about the years from here. Yes. Probably like 19 what? What would you guys say? Or maybe think of an event or something like that that happens early in the 20th century. Maybe from the 1880s to the what? To World War I. Or maybe even to the end of World War I. That needs to be all that that we just said here, plus if there's anything else that you study, should be the answer to number one. Right? So, and... Again, this is a time in the next like minute or two, maybe not you don't ask it here, like, but surprise, I still don't understand historical context. Did you need to follow up with me later on? Okay, about what that is? Because I don't want I don't want to see like, you know, some kind of like confusion here. All right. So all right, beyond that, let's go quickly because this goes back to the last day before we uh, you know, the last quiz on that. Things that they're going to address. Things the progressive to give us a little bulleted list here. Things that they are going to address. What are the progressives going to address? What is it? Go ahead, Andre. Temperance for sure. That's one that you always. And what is temperance? What? Is, what? Go ahead. Well, like, exactly. It's not so much not drinking and everything like that. The kind of like, you know, moderation. In some cases, the absence of, of consuming alcohol. Like, again, some kind of control of that. Uh, early reformers like Frances Willard, other women's Christian temperance union. Don't need to really remember her, but no, that's definitely temperance movement. Go ahead, just hit me with that list here. Go ahead, hit us. Workers' rights and... And voting reforms, that's right. Voting reform. Thing is, they want, they don't want socialism. They want more what in America? Efficiency, for sure. Scientifically, for sure. They want more efficiency. They want, like, commissions, commissioners to take over cities. But what else do they want in government? They don't want socialism, anarchy. They don't want what devs. And maybe some other people like Emma Goldman want. What else do they want? What is the the kind of uh, like you know governmental principle they want? They just want it to be more what like the 1820s, 
like when you pass amendments and everything, what is the D word? They just want, huh? Yeah, they want it to be more democratic. They want more democracy. They're, here's the thing is, unlike the populists, you know the progressives, they're flag waving. And what about progressives in trust and monopolies? Are they the enemy? Do they want to present themselves as the enemy of big business? No. no. But somebody explain that. What do you mean? That I thought they were the enemy because they want to like rein it in. They want to regulate it like that. You know, for the, I thought they were the enemy. I thought they were like, you know, again, they're the, you know, ones that say, hey, we need to like, you know, change a lot, get rid of all these trusts. Get rid of all these monopolies like that. So, go ahead. Uh, I was thinking more of like maybe the government is more the enemy because they're trying to get. Um, well, they're not saying government is the enemy. They're going, the progressive says, this is a time, everybody's coming to agreement this time. I'm glad you said that. Let's all come to agreement, even in this classroom. You at home. They always say that. I say, that's okay. You at home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that that you guys that they want to make sure that like if anything here that uh, they want to preserve democracy for, uh, and use government to we need a referee we need some kind of like omnipresent or kind of powerful thing that's beyond the corporations to come in and to kind of like you know Decide what is fair. On here. Now, speaking of that, if I just want to talk about on tomorrow's quiz, like Theodore Roosevelt's, like, you know, square deal, we always think of just square, but he's really, if you guys ever play cards, Mr. Price never has, uh, they're like that, just a swinking. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> with the boys, uh, so that he wanted to give you a fair, like, fair hand. Like everybody deserves a fair hand into the thing. Not so much that everything is equal, that everybody gets the best hand. What if every, what does that sound like if if Theodore Roosevelt says, I want everybody to get the best hand of cards, huh? What is it? Communism. Right. Everybody's the same, everybody's gonna be treated like, you know, real like the best. No. He's saying that at least if you if Logan is dealing like in a card game. That I should give you a fair hand and not like, you know, dealing from the bottom of the deck or something. Okay. All right. So that's what they're saying here. The government must step in at this time. Tell me this. Is this going to be top down? They want to start at the federal level or do they want to start at the local level? Local. Very good. I think you guys see this. Why would they start at the local level? What will give you the clue deduction that like where there, a lot of people are seeing locally like they need some changes and reforms knowing this this is again a historical context of the gilded age what do they see locally corruption political machines choosing the candidates one of the first things they're going to recommend in a way here is this why should we have the state legislators who are chosen by the political machines to choose the senators Right, there should, there should be it should be a direct election of senators, and then eventually get in like you know 1916, like that the 17th Amendment, like that you know. So you get the direct election of senators. They want that. Some other reforms they'll eventually get initiative. All right, referendum. All right, so uh, North Carolina just voted on like again really a referendum. Really, it's like the change in the state constitution during this time have that even recall now you hear recall now it's not really worth for like bad candidates or oh man i regret it i voted for that person but back then it was one hey they called like you know uh mayor spencer sweet like say again everything you know uh taking bribes a lot of money so and now what do we do he's still our mayor until the next election maybe we can recall him, okay and the Australian ballot. What was that? It's labeled that because what is the Australian ballot? Secret ballot. And it's actually printed out. I tell you, I love a lot of the, the national elections 
or some of the elections that you would not allow, like to say, I, I want to vote for William Jennings Bryan. Well, he's not running this year. Isaiah, wait, it's 1896. He's not running like that, you know? I, I'm totally serious. You guys don't understand how voting used to be. It was not pre-printed ballots. It was not those things here. It was in the open. Gabriel says, I cast my ballot for, like that, you know, for that. Or they tell you who's, here are the candidates running for office, and here's the ones that you're going to vote. They started evolving. But really, in the early 20th century, it's like, no, they needs to be more private. It needs to be more formally written out. It needs to be more standardized. All right? You hear that a lot. You're going to start hearing that in the train regulations. What is standardization? What does that mean, standardization? Yeah. Everything works on the same system. So there cannot be some corruption, not be some kind of like, you know, uh, differences in here. So, and that's exactly what, and I'm kind of going, I'm sorry, I'm kind of putting a lot of things in and out of place, but things are relating one to the other. And that's exactly what the Elkins Act did in 1907. Who's president in 1907? Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt says, let's put some teeth in the ICC. What is the ICC? <clears throat> Very good. And I think all you guys know that, the Interstate Commerce Commission. Let's max out some railroad rates. Can anybody tell me from yesterday's class what was the earlier 1904 act that tried to get rid of the rebate system here? It wasn't the Hepburn, but it's like, you know, going in alphabetical order. It was the what act? If anybody can remember. If not, it's okay. Elkins. Yeah, you guys had Elkins Act. So the Elkins and Hepburn Act, probably if you get a question like that tomorrow, I'm not going to be trying to say uh, the difference between the Elkins and the Hepburn Act. That's not probably a very fair question, but you should know they relate to what business? Railroads. Railroads. It relates to the railroads, okay, in there. So those things. So this is what they want to do. And I love that Jacob says, you know, efficiency. Again, Taylorism, all those things there says make the business more like, you know, efficient. I mean, we already got assembly lines going before Henry Ford. First grade, like, Henry Ford, assembly line, Henry Ford, assembly line, like that, you know. No, there's assembly lines already going. Is so how can you better manage them? These guys are coming in to who are the progressives. They're the experts. They're going to like, because they study like businesses in, you know, uh, Great Britain, like again, they're going to use this, the new management styles in here to make things more efficient, more profitable. We're going to help your business. We're helping capitalism, all right? Really, that's the thing is, to survive. And you might want to offer workers compensation. And does anybody know what that is, like that? Like when you get hurt on the job, you get paid. Like I said, for that and everything. So uh, on that, so it's to be efficient for them. The workers will be more motivated to like, you know, work or not fake injuries, fake sickness or whatever. They know like, you know, if there, if there is something that maybe is a dangerous part of the job, they can do something about it. Like I said, something to become. And really after 1911, um, Starting in New York, about 30 states will offer, you know, uh, workers' compensation. Does anybody know what tragic event that I think we talked about in December that happened that would kind of precipitate that? The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire. Very, very tragic. Like that. So, so. Uh, uh, picture people, I'm only going to be doing this by like 10 more minutes anyway. Okay. So, that's, I don't want you to think. So. Uh, very good. Like again, so you get that. So, and this is all on the Theodore Roosevelt. And by the way, let's go in a little bit in the Theodore Roosevelt. What makes him as kind of like this? You know, what should we know about him? And one of the things you should know about like Theodore Roosevelt is one that he is going to be a supporter of this progressive agenda. So that's one. He's progressive. He's a supporter of progressive agenda. Two, he is going to use his popularity and his position, he calls it the bully pulpit, that's the language back in the early 20th century, to get his legislation passed. Now, knowing what you know just maybe since first grade, do you think he's a popular president in history or even during his time? 
Yes. When you're a popular president, regardless what party you are, you tend to get more of your way. You guys are not experienced and overwhelmingly popular president in your lifetime. All right. Someone who has about 65 to 70 percent on the most on a consistent basis of popularity. All right. Probably the last one I would have to say is Ronald Reagan in a way. Like again, you can say this about any even though Mr. President is not like him. But I was in the minority for sure. You know, like I said most people did. You can get one. That's the second thing. Third thing, he's gonna bring back the popularity and prominence of the presidency or bring back the kind of like, you know, the the kind of, uh, you know, um, attention to the president. All right. Go ahead. Name me all the, the presidents after the Civil War. Name me three. You got one. Well, but, but what's my point? And, and actually, nobody really cares. I, but I bet you know from first grade. I didn't have to. You, you didn't learn in my class Theodore Roosevelt. You knew Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. Like they, sometimes you get them confused with Frank, but you knew. You know the like the popular presidents already since first grade. Like that, you know? So you know that. So that ought to tell you right there about Lice again. So he's known for that too, bringing back the kind of popularity of the president, like, you know, on center stage on here. Yes. All right, Theodore Roosevelt, because McKinley, you know, he, again, he shouldn't have went up to Buffalo. <laughs> so, oh, right down there, like that, so, I'm sorry. I mean, he talked about McKinley. <laughs> I didn't know he had those strong powers there, so. But, uh, <laughs> hey, don't talk about William McKinley. But uh, he was assassinated, so in 1901, to 1909. So actually, you know, really in his first year of being reelected after like, you know, downing William Jennings Bryan again in 1900. Franklin Roosevelt here, so we're 1933 to 1945. All right. All right, cool. All right, so let's do the three C's. And I mentioned this, I think uh, some people probably nod in their head. You might have forgotten like one or two of them and everything about on his agenda here. All right. So is control of corporations. That's probably the hard one, G. All right. So, and can I just expand a little bit before I get to the other two C's, how he's going to do that? He's going to break up Northern Securities Trust. All right. Amongst other trusts. You're like, Mr. Price, what's Northern Securities? Is that like Target? No. It actually involves J.P. Morgan, J.J. Hill, and the train and railroad business. Right. So control of corporations. And in 1902, he's already experienced, and this is pretty big, he's going to start to, like, you know, again, get involved in the anthracite coal mining strike. This is big because he's getting involved. What was the past involvement by presidents and government? What was their kind of reaction to any type of like, you know, train strike, some kind of national strike? What was the usual reaction, car blanche or by default? Ignore or who you're going to support in a almost, you know, overwhelmingly, the corporate. This one, he says, you know, the coal miner like owners come up to him and they say, hey, you know, and Theodore Roosevelt listens to him. This is why one of the reasons why people do like Theodore Roosevelt, you know, despite whatever party you thought maybe if he you can get his ear, he could try to be fair. And he asked him, like, man, if I really wanted to, I would have taken these guys and, you know, like thrown them downstairs or something like that. Gave them a good whooping <laughs> here and their side. Now, he does not go to the other stream and say, like, oh, yeah, give him the 20% wage. He starts kind of, you know, what we call arbitration in a way. And arbitration, unlike mediation, is what? If a Brayton is sent into, like, arbitration instead of mediation, what will the workers and the owners agree to already? To Brayton coming in as an arbitrator. What is it that you do on the arbitration, unlike mediation? 
If Brayton comes in as a mediator, you guys know that one. What does a mediator do? Right. You had arbitrator listens both sides. Here's what's going to happen, all right? And Theodore Roosevelt said, this is what's going to happen, or I'm going to send the troops in not to shoot the coal miners. I know that's what you expect, you know, using like past history that we just like start shooting the workers like that. I know, I'm t totally serious. Like, why he's not shooting the workers in the truth? To take over the mines, oh my God, a government takeover of a mine and run it himself, all right? So they says, no, you're going to do this. Now, the workers don't get everything. They get a 10% raise, and they don't even get a right, really, to organize a strike for the next three years. But actually, the coal miners are like, when they said, they're sending the arbitrator down. <laughs> is that like the Pinkertons? Once like, again, are they going to like start fire? Seriously, it's a normal reaction, right? Like, no, he said this is going to be trying to, like, give here our side. That's revolutionary in a way at this time. Does everybody understand why that's important of control of corporations? Right? And that's what's going to be a result. 10%. They don't get everything, I tell you. They don't get a right to organize in this time. So, and you know, this is how most people are like, you know, fueling their homes, getting the heat, and how most like, you know, businesses are fueling still at this time is with coal in the early 20th century. All right. So control of corporations, he wants to get rid of what? All the trusts? Yes, the bad trust, like that and everything. And he's going to break up some more in the industry, but those are the most famous. All right, consumerism. Right? So, uh, again, the drugs are like, you know, that you're taking for your migraines. Like, I'm having these kinds of, oh, just take this. Now I'm blind. <laughs> so take this. Now I can't hear. <laughs> take this. I can't walk. Uh, <laughs> saying, Don't worry, I got your money. Like that, yeah. Seriously. So. These magazines by journalists known as muckrakers, really in Collier's, Harper's Weekly, those magazines, they expose these bad drugs. And you know what? So there's a, in 1906, you get the uh, Pure Food and Drug Act. You cannot just say, here, take this. Like that. It's got to be some form of label. Not like the ingredients today. It's like, oh my God, like, you know, I thought these wheat thins are healthy for me. There's like 50 ingredients in them. Benzoid peroxide. <laughs> like, is that edible? Should I be taking that? Should, should I be eating that? You know? <laughs> so I still think that's a, a terrible marketing ploy. Wheat thins. Oh, I'm getting wheat. I'm getting healthy. And I'm getting thin. <laughs> Did I get on the scale? <laughs> and I'm still like suffering. It's like, man, oh man, those bastards. Like I say, so. I know, exactly. So marketing is, I tell you, those are the smartest people in the world. I'll tell you, it's the advertisers. They're the smartest people in the world. Uh, anyway, so you get that. But the big one, of course, you read The Jungle by what author did anybody remember? Often Sinclair. And they said, look, we need to start, you know, we're going to pass the Meat Inspection Act, all right, of 1906 too as well. Consumerism. And I'll get to the final C and we'll end it right there, but I just want to go through that again. That's some of the things that he's going to do for consumers, all right? As a result of muckraking, as a result of, like, publications like The Jungle, that book there, that, that's what's going on here. And actually, back then, they had a USDA, and actually, it was the U.S., you know, um, uh, drug agency that was doing this. Thing. Today, it's the Department of Agriculture. It's the USDA Department of Agriculture. But anyway, it's a good first step, all right? Last C here, and it's kind of what he's known for, is conservation. One of the first things that I want to distinguish real quick, conservation, this is not the modern environmental movement, all right? They want to do really, you know, they're rationing the kind of the um, environment. They want it, the government wants to use it. They want to be able to cut down the trees and manage them in a way. They're doing more conservation than preservation. Does everybody understand that? I know you guys think about preservation, you think about like a building, but like I think of like, you might have heard of the uh, Arctic National Wildlife Refuge up there in Alaska. It's like 20 million acres and stuff, and it's really being preserved. Like there's really, they're not kind of like managing it. They're like, look, just don't, you know, do anything on it. But they, but Teddy, all right, and Gifford Pinchot, they want to do conservation. New Lands Reclamation Act. 
of 190, I think, or 402. I'm kind of getting mixed up a little bit, but don't worry, that's enough. It's going to start like managing irrigation projects in the water. All right, huh? What? New lands, like new lands reclamation. I'm sorry, I can't. What? Why people, students can't speak up anymore? I, and I know I'm hard of hearing, but then it's like people are like just, I, and I need microphones or something like that. Thank you, thank you. And think, I just want to know if it's just me, just my hard ear. I bet you get it here. What's your name? What? Back in the old days, and this is even before your time, like say, speak up. They would actually like do that. Like saying, I can't do that anymore because I'll get fired in a lawsuit and everything like, like that. And I, 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 I don't know. I just thought, well, go ahead. Shh. Shh. All right, conservation, you're actually managed. You actually, the government will cut down trees and actually use those. You get it? But they will manage it. Preservation, you leave it alone. You actually, nobody really goes in there. The only reason why rangers or somebody might be in there is to protect that people are not squatting in there using the resource, all right? So. Right, right, right. All right, finally, that, go ahead. Right, exactly, all right? And, and John Muir was said, like, why don't you just leave it alone? But don't worry, well, you don't really have to know him, like, and everything. All right, final thing here is like, so again, just a National Monuments Act of 1906. It's just kind of, he's reserving a lot of parks, you know, like, again, in Wyoming and all kinds of places there. So uh, it's a national monument. And, and, uh, uh, and that's in there for conservation. All right, so all right, I want to end it. Plus, these guys got to like do their job and everything for us. Cool.